Hey folks, welcome to live on YouTube. Today we're gonna to be talking about the seven things that you should know about permaculture. We're gonna get started right away here. So I'm just gonna start sharing my screen. So if you're just getting on, please introduce yourself. Let us know where you're coming from, what your name is. And the presentation should take just a little bit less than an hour and then I'll have some time for Q&A at the end. Okay, here we go. just getting in just introduce yourself and we're going to get started right now all right folks so i wanted to do this presentation i made it a couple of years ago uh, it's based on a blog that i wrote on my website which i'll leave a link to below uh, a little bit later it's also in the blog book which you can download for free and the link is in the free resources below um, if you just go to the notes right now under free resources, um, you can find a link to download the blog book. And so if you want to follow along the blog, you're welcome to do so. Um, there's a lot of confusion out there about what permaculture is. So I wanted to provide some insight with regards to what permaculture aims to do. So here we go. So a lot of people don't even know what Verge Permaculture does. Um, so we help you to design and build your resilient home acreage or farm so that you can thrive no matter what. That's the whole mission behind Verge Permaculture. And so what we do is we provide educational programs that help you to understand what resilience actually means in terms of your resilient home acreage or farm. And so this is going to help explain how we do some of those things using permaculture and engineering as our guide. So the title of today's talk is seven things you should know about permaculture. So let's get into it, guys. So the objectives for today's talk is to de de demystify permaculture, hopefully to evoke questions and curiosity and create excitement about ecological design and the creation of resilience. So if you're just getting in, make sure that you introduce yourself. Hey, Coast to Coast Coffee, nice. I just had one of your coffees today. If you guys are looking for a great coffee service, these guys are the ones to go to. So you can check them out online. Um, while we're going through the talk, if we're if, if things are making sense to you and you're getting value out of the talk, please uh, hit the like button below. Really appreciate that. Um, also, feel free to share this on social media. It helps the channel track. Thanks so much, guys. Okay, so permaculture is a design system to meet human needs full stop. Um, however, it has one additional important paradigm shift in it because we're not just trying to meet human needs, we're trying to do it in a way that actually enhances ecosystemic health. Okay, so that's why one statement that you'll hear me talk about on a regular basis is permaculture uh, is the design of sustainable human habitat. Now, if we think about the conventional system, we have this paradigm in which um, the only thing that the conventional system aims to do is meet human needs, full stop. With permaculture, we're adding that additional layer on of meeting human needs while enhancing ecosystemic health. It's really important. I mean, if you think about it, what's, what's absolutely insane right now is this huge uh, race towards space. It's really exciting. It's neat to see how humanity is kind of working together to figure out how to um, get off the earth. Um, and potentially create another civilization on another planet. And I think that there is some justification for it. I'm not entirely against this idea of going to Mars, although I think that it's wrought with technical challenges. The thing that I think is really ironic about the idea of going to another planet is, and even living on the space station is, is really interesting. If you start thinking about all the design challenges associated with living on the space station, 
um, we have to essentially replace all of the ecological functions that we get for free here on earth that we actually take for advantage it's not just free we take take it for advantage and so moving to mars or living in a space station is we're going to require us to recycle all of our water it's going to require us eventually to grow all of our own food it requires us to produce or recycle our own oxygen um, it requires us to create enormous amounts of heat to live on planets as cold as mars uh, there's just all of these things that we just take for granted and it's totally fine to talk about these things in the context of going to Mars or living in space. But the minute you talk about creating closed loop systems to meet human needs while enhancing ecosystemic health here on planet Earth, you're instantly relegated to the realm of hippies um, or some environmentalist tree loving whatever. And the thing is, is that that couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, planet Earth is our only spaceship right now. We don't really know how to live off of this planet, and we probably won't for quite a long time. And so permaculture aims to look at all of our waste streams, all of our um, production streams, all of our uh, requirements and needs as humans, both from a community level, but also from a technical level, and figures out how to create systems that allows us to be part of the ecosystem. And, the last thing I want to talk about this is this mythology that you're probably all aware of, which is this idea that um, humans are inherently destructive. So you may have never read those words, but those concepts and themes end up in all of our media. It ends up on social media. And one of the reasons that we have this idea is that our current paradigm aims to just meet human needs without working with ecosystems. So humans are not inherently destructive. We just got the design wrong. And so when we're talking about creating whole, holistic, um, closed loop systems, we use permaculture to do that. And there's plenty of evidence to show that humans can be just as positive as we are negative. We just have to change the way that we look at design. So tying into that whole myth is, is this concept that humans are part of the solution, not part of the problem. And again, like you can go everywhere. In, in fact, it's not even really that surprising that this myth exists. I mean, you can look at all of the destruction that we have created on the planet and there's plenty of it. And I don't really want to get into all of the evidence that exists on how destructive we are. We know that we've done some bad stuff. Um, the thing is, anybody here that is on this talk that's a canoeer knows that when you're canoeing down a river, you never look at the rocks, okay? You try and stay away from looking at the rocks. You need to find the path through the river, through the rapid that will get you safely to the other side. And so it's important to acknowledge that the river has rocks, but we don't wanna focus on the rocks. We wanna focus on the solutions or the pathways that we wanna end up taking. And so the problem with solutions-oriented media or going out and seeking the solutions is that it's hard to find. And so one of the things that we find by teaching the permaculture design course is that we bring those solutions to the fore so that people can focus on them so that they can see that there are um, opportunities to change course. Um, one of the other big issues that um, people face is, is this idea that the problems are unsurmountable. But when you actually start looking at local action and how individuals are making change on a really small scale, it's the aggregate of these small changes that creates massive, massive shifts. So humans are part of the solution. We have to change the discourse around this because language is so important. Language will actually direct where we go as a species. And so if we don't start acknowledging that we can be part of the solution, then we're always just gonna be part of the problem. Now I've left a link uh, on this slide, biomatrixwater.com. I think it's a wonderful company. They're out of Scotland. There's a sister company or a company that's equivalent in the United States, um, Biohaven, I think, Biohaven Water Systems. If somebody could find that and put it up in the chat, that'd be really, I'd be really appreciative of that. Um, these guys basically repair waterways, lakes, ponds, and they do it with floating wetlands. It's Nothing short of miraculous. It's unbelievable what these guys do. So they take a resource like fossil fuel and they build these floating uh, plastic docks essentially that are that, that can move with the water action. And then they plant them with locally available 
uh, wetland plants. And in doing so, they clean, they oxygenate, they remove pollutants, um, they restore ecological function back to the system. It's equivalent to putting a stitch into a cut. They create sutures. And over time, if they've done their job right, those sutures disappear and you just have a functional ecosystem in the background. So check them out. They're an amazing company. So amazing that I actually considered stopped. Um, uh, to, I considered stop running. I considered to stop running Verge Permaculture in order to go and work for them uh, because I was so inspired by the work that they were doing. So Biohaven um, Treatment or Biohaven uh, Floating Wetlands is the company that you want to check out in the States if you're interested in this technology. This is another example of how productive humans can be. And so by showing this slide, I don't necessarily want people to uh, just go around and key line plow everything, but this was an appropriate use of key line plowing um, you know, to repair this ecosystem. And so a key line plow is a non-inversion plow that creates micro channels under the soil by pulling this mechanism, this plow mechanism with a tractor. And so Owen Hablitzel, who is a colleague of mine, um, ended up working on this property. This was an old burned out cotton field. And, and if you don't know anything about cotton, or um, if you know anything about cotton, cotton is one of the most destructive crops on the planet. There, because it's not being used for food, at least most of it, um, there's no real herbicide limitations. There's no pesticide limitations. You can just put whatever you want on the land. And so let's just dig a little bit into what's going on here on this ecology. And so on the left-hand side, we've got this old burned out field and you can see all those cracks in it. This is really typical of what happens to soil when you lose all of the soil carbon, which is in my opinion, one of the, and actually not just my opinion, Dr. Rattan Lal's opinion, one of the largest contributors to GHG emissions globally. When you lose the carbon in the soil, the soil no longer has the ability to absorb water. And so what happens is all of those fines, clay, silt uh, fines come to the surface and they'll glay off. And by glay, I mean seal off the top of that soil surface. So the next rain that comes along in an environment like this, which is brittle, which typically means that we're going to have one, maybe two, maybe three rains per year, none of the water is going to infiltrate. And so the system ostensibly just crashes and dies. So when you come in here with a micro um, channel plow, like a key line plow at the right pattern, you can't just go and plow this willy nilly. Then what happens is that water that was no longer able to prime the system now goes deep into the ground and will activate the existing seed bed that exists there. As that seed bed gets activated, because now there's moisture in there, then all of a sudden the plants grow. As the plants grow, you end up reducing evaporation on the top of the surface of the soil, which increases soil moisture, which increases plant growth, which increases soil carbon um, creation or the, the movement of carbon into the soil. And a 1% increase in soil carbon will increase the amount of water holding capacity on a hectare of land by about 166,000 liters, which is roughly 40,000 uh, gallons, sorry, 20,000 gallons per acre, I believe is the conversion. So this example right here shows how a very small suture in the landscape, there was no seed added into the system, no fertilizer, no compost teas or extracts. It was just literally, we just allowed a little bit of water to get in below that, that uh, baked surface so that the system could prime itself and uh, start operating. Um, and now we've got this grass growing on here. So we can be just as positive as we are negative. We just have to go out there and seek uh, examples. China uh, just announced that they're going to um, move 60,000 of their military troops into trying to increase the, the country's forest cover by 3% in the next four years. I mean, this is nothing short of amazing. We need more examples. I mean, imagine if we turned all of the um, global military infrastructure into tree planting equipment. I mean, it would only take five, maybe 10 years to replant the 50% of the trees that have been lost over the last 12,000 years which would completely transform the albedo of the planet, would put carbon back into the soils and get that water back into the ground where it belongs. Um, it's that water in the ground that keeps our creeks and streams running perennially. Permaculture reframes the world. So we can only control our lives by controlling our perceptions. 
And so this is the idea of the problem being the solution. Permaculture is a design system based in positivism. Now it's interesting, and you probably didn't think you were gonna get a lesson on how brains work, but, <coughs> excuse me. Um, the prefrontal cortex of our brain is the thinking part of our brain. It's a very thin layer. It's the newest addition to our brain. And it's easily overwhelmed by the back parts of our brain, which respond to fear um, and concern. Um, you know, these are the parts of the brain back here that were designed to get away from saber toothed tigers. And so when we get scared about something, it literally shuts the front part of our brain off and we're no longer able to actually design solutions anymore. And I would argue that the state of the world, the problems that we face that we're up against are much more complex than saber toothed tigers, which is what we originally would have been trying to run away from. And so we actually need to uh, stop thinking about all the bad stuff and start focusing on the good stuff that we can do. And so permaculture, again, is based in this concept of positivism. It's baked into the DNA of permaculture itself. And in addition to all of this, um, the prime directive of permaculture is to take responsibility for your, your own actions and that of your children and to get your house and garden in order to shelter and feed you so that you can take care of yourself, which sounds really selfish. But the idea is, is that if every single one of us just took a little bit more responsibility for ourselves, so we, we all had six months to a year of food, we largely figured out where to get renewable or sustainable energy sources, we created strong communities around ourselves, we harvested our own rainwater, um, you know, all of these big giant problems, which I think are just symptoms of broken communities, essentially, would just disappear. Uh, and so with the positivism and the self-motivation to actually make change within our own life, this is the solution that I believe, because this is what I do for a living, is how we're going to change the course of humanity. Nothing short of that. Um, and so tied in with this whole concept of positivism is the concept of um, always turning the problem into the solution. So you don't have a slug problem, you have a duck deficiency. You don't have a grasshopper problem, you just need a few more chickens on your property or turkeys. Um, we can always turn this negative thing into a positive thing. And it's amazing how often the solution emerges when you just shift your brain into thinking about positive things as opposed to always uh, worrying about the negative stuff. Permaculture is a new way of defining sustainability. So the word sustainability has kind of been co-opted. It's used everywhere. Um, I think people have generally gotten a little bit um, complacent about the word. Um, one of the jokes that I've heard to told over and over again is this concept um, that I think it was uh, uh, McKenna uh, said that if um, one of you guys came to me and asked me, let's just, uh, for the sake of this conversation, let's say Frankie came to me and said, hey, Rob, how's your marriage doing these days? And I told her, oh, you know, it's pretty sustainable. Um, she'd probably feel pretty sad for me. You know, it's like, who wants to live with a, a sustainable marriage? It's like, we want regenerative marriages. We want marriages that get better with time, not just kind of sustain. And so if we think about sustainability and the definition of sustainability, which is to sustain, to maintain, Really, the, uh, the issue that we're dealing with is, do we really want to sustain dead zones in the ocean? Do we want to sustain degraded rivers and creeks? Do we want to sustain broken communities? Do we want to sustain food that doesn't have any nutrition in it? No, we don't want to do any of that stuff. We're not in a position to be sustainable right now. We actually have to think about things through the lens of regeneration, through fixing it, through repair. And so... Permaculture is an earth repair mechanism that helps us to fix systems, to improve our own situation, our own quality of life, our own metrics. And so when we think about what we're trying to do through this design system, we're trying to sequester CO2, partially because it's the right thing to do, but because it in puts carbon into our soils, which sequesters more water, which makes more nutrient dense food, which creates more habitat, which creates more resilience. We want our systems to grow in topsoil. And so by putting that carbon in there, we now structure the uh, subsoils below our feet. And uh, again, it makes better plants. It makes 
for more water storage. It makes for a, a more, uh, ultimately a more sustainable system, but it's actually a form of regeneration. We want our systems to recharge aquifers. So, it, you know, it's really simple to go out and drill a well somewhere and just pull water out of the ground. Um, but most of us never take that next step, which is like, well, where does that water come from? And how is that water recharged within that aquifer? And will it ever run out? And are there things that I can do to make sure that um, in my lifetime or in my kid's lifetime or in their kid's lifetime, that that aquifer is going to remain full so that we have an abundant so supply and source of water into the future. We want our systems to clean rivers and lakes. So imagine if all the water that fell on your property, small or large, doesn't matter if you live on an urban size, size lot or a rural farm, uh, that, that the lakes and rivers are going to, uh, um, like the water will leave your property into those lakes and rivers cleaner than it came onto your property. So in essence, our properties are bioreactors. They're cleaning the air and the water that enters its sphere of influence um, so that everything else around it is cleaner because waste is just an unused resource. It's something that needs to be put to productive use. It, it's a niche or a function missing within the system that's not able to use that waste product essentially. So waste products, just an opportunity. We want our systems to make people happier. We're not going to attract people to vinegar, most people anyways, unless you're a big apple cider vinegar person. Um, but most people are very attracted to honey. And by, the, by that, I'm giving you guys a metaphor between um, positivism versus negativism. So we need our systems to taste better. They need to be more fun. We need to take the fear out of it and just go straight for um, why our lives are better when we do these things, as opposed to if you don't do it, you're going to be in trouble. We want our systems to increase our resilience. And again, if we're all more resilient, then the whole planet becomes more resilient. The, the lack of resilience that exists right now is because we live in this system that's based on just-in-time everything, just-in-time food, just-in-time um, communication, just-in-time friendships, just-in-time social events, just-in-time community. Everything is second by second by second by second. We don't plan anymore. We don't plan where our food's going to come from or what we're going to be doing a week from now. Um, and that's because we're all carrying around these smartphones that allow us to make second by second decisions. It allows us to live faster, but it doesn't allow us to live smarter. And we need to really bring that into the fore back again. We want our properties to improve air quality, and we want our properties to increase family cohesion as well as community cohesion. One of the biggest things that people get out of a permaculture design course is access to a community of like-minded individuals that are dealing with similar concerns. Um, and when people connect in with other people that are rowing in a similar direction, it's amazing how their outlook on life completely changes. Um, a lot of people within day two or three of a permaculture design course say, oh my gosh, I finally found my community of people that think the same way that I do and, and don't think that I'm completely uh, insane for thinking the ways that I do. So it's important that you have community. I once had um, a, a group of Mormons take my class and they said to me, it's like, I can't understand why you keep harping on the importance of community. And I said, well, it's because it's really important for all the reasons that we've just talked about. And they said, and, and, and they went through the class and they were thinking about these comments. And then at the end of the class, they said, you know, I finally realized why you're so big on community and why it just hasn't been resonating with me. And she said, it's because um, all of my community, all of the people that I hang out with Mormons, basically um, already have what you're talking about, which all these other people in the class don't have. Now I'm not Mormon, but what I can tell you is that the Mormons have a lot of stuff right. They store your food, they support their own, they get together on a weekly basis and celebrate community. Um, they have board game nights with their family. I, I had a lot of Mormon friends growing up. And so I have a lot of respect for um, a lot of the Mormon philosophies. And so we're all going out and seeking that connection with people that have a common interest or common goal in mind. And uh, that's really what ended up striking this person at the end was that a lot of people that don't have, uh, you know, a church to go to, essentially, especially a church that's built around resilience and this concept of resilience, 
um, are really feeling lost, depressed, and lonely. Um, so a lot of people get that sense of connection after taking one of our programs or a program that's based in permaculture anyways. It doesn't have to be our program. Um, permaculture is a systems approach to design. So I was just writing this this morning in another blog, but basically when you're trying to create a closed loop system for your small urban homestead or your large acreage, there's a lot of systems involved. There's a lot of thinking. There's a lot of design and it gets complex really quickly. And the only way that you can deal with complexity is with a process, with a system, with a step-by-step -step approach to managing that complexity. And one of the most effective ways to manage that complexity is by constraining things. But you need to know what to constrain. And so if, if you've been watching YouTube Live on this channel for a little while, you'll know that we've been talking about things like water access and structures. So um, water access and structures is a way of constraining a system around water, essentially, because water is central to life. It's a master element on any property. And if you don't have it, you, you won't be able to thrive. If you do have it, you can manage it property, properly, then the system operates almost effortlessly. And so water is a great constraining mechanism. Another constraining tool that we use is the land use bylaw. So what's legal in your jurisdiction versus not? What does your local municipality allow you to do um, on your particular property. There's all sorts of other types of constraints. For example, your solar resource. How much sunlight does your property receive? And is it possible for you to collect enough sun? Yesterday, I was watching um, a video from David Holmgren. He just released a brand new book. And he said, um, on farms, the limiting factor is almost never solar radiation or sunlight. But the minute we get up into uh, back into urban or suburban type situations, sun is almost always a limiting factor because you've got houses beside you. Um, you've got large trees, especially if you're in older areas. And so sun ends up becoming a limiting factor, not water. Um, and so depending on what scale you're operating at will depend on what your constraints are going to end up being. And so it's really important to, under, to have a system and a process to be able to constrain your problem so that you come out the other side uh, with um, a solution that makes sense. Now, I just put a video up on YouTube this morning where I talk about Bruce Mao and one of his quotes on process. If somebody could just uh, pull that up and put it up into the chat window, I'd be really, appreciate, uh, I'd be really appreciative. Um, it's a one minute video. You can watch it a little bit later today, but it really speaks to the, the importance of having process. Um, one of my heroes is Buckminster Fuller, and the best way to predict the future is to design it. Um, he was a, a guy that was well ahead of his time, and uh, I highly recommend reading any of his stuff or watching any of his documentaries. He was a, an incredible thinker, designer, and uh, problem solver. Unbelievable uh, man, for sure. So permaculture is a solutions toolbox. And I talked a little bit about this in a recent YouTube video called the Solutions Matrix. And essentially, the idea is that it, it's full of potential solutions. You just have to figure out which solution to apply at which particular place. And so as an example, we can look at uh, wastewater. So wastewater generally is thought of as a liability. And so um, the way that wastewater systems are designed are basically you bury this infrastructure underground. I'm talking about septic systems here. And if the system's designed properly, you can kind of forget about the wastewater problem for 30 years. However, um, if you think about wastewater through a slightly different set of lenses, Globally, we're talking about having, we have about um, 20 to 30 years of phosphorus left on the planet. Okay, so this is the stuff that we're mining right now. We're turning into fertilizer through a double acidic process, um, which makes it water soluble, and then we apply it on crops. Industrial agriculture will not be around in 20 years, at least not in the way that it is right now, because we will not have enough phosphorus to grow our crops in the way that we're currently growing them. Now, if you ask me if there's enough phosphorus to continue to support 7 billion people, I would say absolutely, but not with the current paradigm. Um, and so when we look at wastewater, wastewater is essentially a stranded resource, okay? It's stranded in that it has tons of phosphorus, it has tons of nitrogen, it has water, which is a, a limiting resource on a lot of properties. Um, it's got micronutrients, 
Um, a lot of it has caffeine, um, which makes your plants grow faster. No, I'm just joking. It doesn't do that. Um, anyways, wastewater is actually a huge resource. And so when we look at wastewater through a permaculture lens, we find ways to put it to productive use. So what loves to grow on nutrient dense water? Well, coppiceable tree systems do. We don't have to worry about pathogens when we're just growing wood that we're going to cut down on a, on a regular basis. So if we can grow coppiceable trees, trees that can be cut and will come again, things like willow um, are a great example. Alder is another example. A lot of trees have this function or ability to be cut and then they'll sprout new shoots right away. Um, then you end up being able to turn your wastewater into an energy resource. So what if we actually designed our house so that it used a certain amount of thermal energy on an annual basis and that that amount of thermal energy coincided with the amount of wood that we could grow off of our wastewater. That's what I'm talking about with regards to a closed loop, closed loop system. So every time you flush the toilet, you end up with a whole bunch of wood growing outside that can end up um, supplying your thermal energy requirements. Maybe the coppiceable tree system also acts as a snow harvesting mechanism and it creates a shelter belt and it creates bee habitat and bird habitat. Um, and it solves an erosion issue. So all of a sudden now, that one element that was using wastewater um, becomes an enormous opportunity. So we turn liabilities into opportunities. And if you're looking to start a business, which a lot of our graduates have done, they specifically go to the liability section of the world and they say, okay, what liabilities can we apply permaculture to to find new opportunities to create a livelihood that puts food on my table, pays my rent, hopefully a lot more than that, but also fixes the planet at the same time. If we're gonna pay mechanical engineers 150 or $200,000 a year to put in gas pipelines, then we should be paying permaculture designers that fix liabilities the same amount. They're adding just as much, if not more value into the economy when they're finding ways of taking stranded assets like septic effluent and putting it to productive use. And there are literally thousands of stranded assets that we can put to productive use, which brings me to another point, which is that you don't do permaculture, you use it within what you do, which means that if you are currently a veterinarian or you're a farmer or you are a dog walker, it doesn't matter what you do for a living. You can bring these ideas into what you currently do. Uh, it just, it changes the paradigm. So permaculture provides solutions for waste and wastewater, homes and buildings, food production, energy, water harvesting, community, and so much more. It's all about how we look at problems as opposed to um, getting stuck in the problems. So permaculture is also a bunch of disciplines rolled into one. So if we think about it through that design modality, it's architecture, it's engineering, it's wastewater management, it's horticulture, it's forestry, it's community development, um, it's resilience thinking, um, it's, it's water management. Uh, it's all of these things brought into one, which is kind of ties into um, what I was just saying is that you don't do permaculture, you use it within what you do. Uh, you use all of these different ideas and modalities in the way that we design everything. And so it's, it's, a, it's a complex thing, but when you really get to the fundamental principles of what it is that we're trying to do with permaculture, you realize that um, you know, things just kind of fit together and it's the way that we should have been doing things forever. Um, but, and, and some people say, you know, my parents used to do permaculture. Yes, kind of, and maybe, but there are new ideas that, that are combined with old ideas, which is what makes permaculture unique and new. So it's kind of a bit uh, blurry there. Hopefully you can read it. It's another quote from Buckminster Fuller, which is that there is only one revolution tolerable to all men, all societies, all political systems, revolution by design and invention. Um, and then he has another quote that's similar to this. And if, if we don't get this revolution right, it ends up in blood, basically. And we end up fighting each other because of scarcity and various other reasons. So we have to invent a new system that makes the old system obsolete, which I think is another um, uh, quote from Buckminster Fuller, actually. And once we do that, um, 
a lot of these problems like we're seeing peak oil climate change uh, food security um, all of these problems start to disappear because they're ultimately they're massive massive symptoms of a, a huge aggregate of tiny little problems and that's what i love about permaculture is its ability to diagnose problems and create opportunities and it's only once a, a fairly large number of us start to embrace these ideas that will actually start to turn the boat in a different direction. Um, and that's really one of the main reasons that I left my career to go and help other people to create resilience in their lives. So uh, that concludes the uh, presentation here today, guys. I've got some time uh, to talk about uh, questions. If any of you guys have any Q&A for me, um, please feel free to put it up into the chat window while I'm waiting for your uh, questions. If you guys have any, um, if you found this useful, I'd really appreciate if you hit the like button down below. Um, it really helps the channel. And um, I'll just wait. I'm going to go back and look at some of the comments that you guys have made here. And um, feel free to ask any questions that you have about this presentation. Yeah, Josh just says, once we are running on whale oil, absolutely. There's a book called A uh, Thousand Barrels a Second. And uh, we just about ran out of whales before we discovered oil and gas. And thankfully, we did discover oil and gas because otherwise the world would have no whales in it. Um, and then we wouldn't have had, uh, what was it, Star Trek five or six, when they go back in time to bring a whale up into the future, that movie would never have been created. So thank gosh, there's still whales. Um, but uh, it's, it's interesting how humanity tends to uh, operate on this just-in-time philosophy. All right, just going back here. Mark, I'd love to know how your food uh, security presentation goes on Quadra. That'd be really interesting to hear from you on that. Just going through your comments here. Josh Steele says, we are only 70 years from fighting for our lives, fighting nature, fighting each other, fighting infection, fighting plague. Yeah, it's a common theme. Everybody's got a different time frame, but it all comes to the same thing. And the time frame is kind of irrelevant because the goal with all of this, one of the things that is really important in permaculture is this concept of um seven generations thinking so we can't just think about what's going to happen in my lifetime or my kids lifetime what's going to happen in seven generations from now and how can we make decisions that will benefit seven generations down the road yeah seek to find permaculture reframes the belief that there's not enough resources on the planet but that there's only there's truly abundance so I totally agree with that. And uh, when you look at how degraded our agricultural fields are, I mean, they're all just growing one thing. Um, they're producing at a fraction of the capacity that they would be if they were working in polycultures. So there really is no shortage whatsoever. Seek to find, or Frankie says, as you say, we should be thinking and designing for seven generations to come. Absolutely. Seek to find our hundred year old farm used the same lagoon for sewage treatment for the entire century and still sustains the ecology around it even now. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, lagoons seem like such a bad idea, but when you look at a lot of them, if they're designed properly um, and they definitely could be designed better, but a lot of them actually support enormous amounts of life. Frankie says, yes, I totally agree with the community. So do the Amish. I study them. Yeah, the Amish are really interesting people and I'd like to actually read some books on them. So if you have any books on the Amish, Frankie, I'd love to get some suggestions from you. Josh, humans fought to sustain their existence and largely lost. The baby boom was the first time we multiplied for reasons other than outpacing death. Yeah, totally interesting. Hartway Farms. Um, we have a 14 acre farm with fresh water, spring fed creek and separate springs that could be dammed up for a second pond. So it's good to not be damming up springs necessarily. Sometimes it works. There's lots of different modalities that you can look at in terms of storing water on your property. I think that's a really great idea. Um, 
sometimes uh, you know damming up a water course can be problematic um, and so there can be more effective ways of doing it so just keep that in mind Frankie says the importance of following progress in design Heartway Farms lol caffeine fertilizer totally um, our lagoon seek to find says our lagoon was oh I'm, uh, seek to find says our lagoon was a closed loop system then yeah totally uh, Josh, there will always be new ideas combined with old ideas that change our paradigms. Yep, once we were running out of whale oil, now we're running out of fossil oil, even though some people will disagree with that. Mark Dole, are we society looking at the rocks too much or do we have to ensure we acknowledge the rocks? Acknowledging the rocks may require a portage. <laughs> nice analogy, Mark. Uh, Seek to find. Rob, I've been sharing and posting your videos, et cetera, on my other contacts. Sustainable isn't as desirable as abundance. Proper planning, design, and ma management provide abundance, not just sustainability. Great points. Thank you for sharing that. Frankie, I watch a lot of their videos on YouTube. Fantastic, guys. Well, if there are any more questions, I'd love to hear from them. Um, if you're interested in learning more about our permaculture design courses, give us a call. Uh, shout out to us. Our phone number is on the website. You can send us an email. Um, we teach it uh, two to three times a year, depending on the year, and we'd love to have you guys up here. Um, if you're interested in what some people are doing with permaculture, you can check out our grad series. We've got a number of grad videos on YouTube. We've also got a whole section for our alumni on our website uh, that talks about how people are using permaculture in their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, it's a, we've got an enormous amount of content there. And they're really inspiring stories. So I encourage you guys to check those out. Okay, guys. Well, it uh, doesn't look like there's any more questions. Again, if you found this useful, please hit the like button below. Um, I'm going to post this up on YouTube a little bit later today with a few minor tweaks and edits. Uh, and I'll make sure that I put some resources for you guys in the bottom. Um, if you haven't checked out our free resources, you can go there right now. Maybe I'll just do a quick screen share and show you guys how to get access to them. Okay, so this is gonna be kind of funny because uh, I'm sharing the screen that, uh, that you guys, the YouTube screen here. So if you just um, scroll down and take a look at these free resources. So we've got a whole e-course for free on how to design resilient homes, acreages, and farms. Uh, I'm not sure how much longer that will be for free, but it's for free right now, so take a look at it. We've also are, are gonna be shutting down our passive solar greenhouse case studies for free in not too much time from now, so you can go and take a look at those. So much information packed into those um, case studies, so I highly recommend them. They're all professionally produced. They're about uh, 15 to 20 minutes each. So you'll learn a lot about passive solar greenhouse design. Um, and then if you haven't received our Verge blog book, take a look at it. You can download it here with this link um, and it'll take you to our blog book, which um, has all of our best blogs. So they're packed with information in a magazine style format. So it's really beautiful and easy to read. Um, highly, highly recommend uh, taking a look at those right there. I do write a weekly-ish email on uh, things relating to permaculture and permaculture type stuff. So um, if you get the blog book, you'll end up being on our newsletter. Um, and I'd love to have you uh, part of our community. Lastly, there's one other community that I should mention on Facebook. There's a page called Verge Permaculture Students and Friends. It's a wonderful community of people. Most of them have taken our programs. Um, search for it on Facebook and ask to join and I'll, I'll let you in on that community. Um, you can post any permaculture related question there and you'll have over 1200 permaculture uh, grads basically taking a look at your post and potentially answering questions for you. So make sure you join that. Um, and if you're not on our Verge Permaculture Facebook page, there's also a ton of great content that goes up there as well. Okay, guys, I hope you have an incredible week. We'll be on YouTube live at 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time this week for our Introduction to Permaculture Part 4. It's going to be a really great session. Um, I will not be broadcasting on Friday. I'm taking a day off. Um, but we'll be back 
uh, next week on Monday again. Um, and we'll have another exciting permaculture related topic to talk about on YouTube. So thank you so much. I hope you have a great week. Um, hit that like button below and we'll see you guys again on Wednesday evening, 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Thanks so much, guys.